I invite you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Inside your bulletin, there's an outline. And I encourage you, if you want to remember anything from today's message, to take a few notes. Not because it's noteworthy, not because I'm noteworthy, but because you remember longer what you see here and write down. That's just the educational fact. Otherwise, by the time people get to the parking lot, it's all forgotten. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're looking today at the simple subject, grow up grow up. I, ha I enjoyed some, an interchange with some friends on Facebook last night uh, as they were wondering if the sermon was aimed at them. And I said, here's what I said back to the friend, and I'll say this to everybody here. I said, no, but if your phone's ringing, pick it up. See? Answer it. Now, I've been preaching as a pastor of this church 37 years, and I will confess to you that when I was 32 years old and started, I was tempted and probably did make some sermons to aim at people. But God, God quickly got even with me and taught me that was a stupid thing to do. You know what God did? He made sure they weren't there that Sunday. <laughs> true story, true. <laughs> so, you know, it took a one or two times that I thought, man, forget that. <laughs> I got all the trouble of making a sermon up, and then they're not there. So, since that time, I can honestly say I never, ever have made a sermon aimed at anybody. And, and I, you know, God's my witness. I put my hand on the Bible and tell you that. It's never aimed at anybody. As I study each week, I study God's Word to teach it. And what's really cool to me is... And my, my notes are online, so you can check the notes out. They're, they're right there on the website, okay? They're like five years' worth of there. But most of what I say is not in my notes. The outline's there and the verses, the key points, that's it. And so I pray hard the week before for God to give me, bring to my remembrance the things that he wants me to say, and I try to be led by the Holy Spirit. And so because of that, I'm, I'm focused pretty much on the message, so I don't have time to think about who's here, how's they, how are they going to take what I just said. I don't have time for that. People, sometimes they worry that if I'm going to get my feelings hurt because they got up and walked out, you know. They say, I had to go to work. I had to go. I say, I don't care if you had to go to the bathroom. It doesn't matter, okay? <laughs> I don't notice, okay? Now, we would appreciate it if people wouldn't you know, go trace into the bathroom 15 times during the message and not write it during the invitation, but I don't notice that stuff, okay? So I know people have to go to work. I appreciate your coming to hear God's word, okay? For as much time as you can be here. So it doesn't matter to me if you come in late and leave early, if that's what your schedule, you know, dictates for that Sunday, that's fine, okay? Don't ever feel bad about that. That's what I'm trying to get across to you, all right? So God's word has what we all need to help us grow. And that's what we're going to look at today. Stand, please, in reverence to God's Word with me right now, and it will be short, but go ahead and stand up. And I'd like to read, and if you have a Bible, I'd invite you to follow. If you don't have a Bible and you need one, I'll give you one, okay? Just tell me afterwards. We'll see that you get a Bible. Ephesians 4. 14 and 15 are my text for the day, okay? And remember the subject is grow up. Paul the Apostle says, and he's talking here about what he give, why he gave pastors and teachers to the church. He says he gave them for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry till we all come to the unity of the faith, verse 13, and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of 
deceitful plotting, but contrast, speaking the truth in love, and now here's the text, here's the subject, may grow up, underline or circle that when you sit down, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. And God will add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Big idea I want you to write down, and I left it blank in your bulletin, and I don't want them to give you the picture till after we write it down together, okay? I was going to put it in there for you. I thought, no, if, you write it, if they write it down, they'll remember it longer. Here's the big idea for today's message. God wants me to be a mature adult believer, not a spiritual thumbsucker. God wants me to be a mature adult believer, not a spiritual thumbsucker. Say that with me now, okay? Let's say it all out loud together. God wants me to be a mature adult believer, not a spiritual thumbsucker. Say it again. God wants me to be a mature adult believer, not a spiritual thumbsucker. Now, just let that little image, you know, percolate there in your brain for 10 seconds. God does not want us to be spiritual thumbsuckers. And I should have said unspiritual thumbsuckers. There's nothing spiritual about a thumbsucker in the Christian life. Little babies suck their thumb, don't they? And uh, forget about all the what, all arguments about whether that's good or bad or indifferent, okay? I know that, but little babies do, and so people can understand that to some degree, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, you know. But if you saw somebody who was an adult sitting in church doing that, you know, what would you think? Yeah, that's what I thought you'd think. That's what a lot of people, that's what a lot of Christians look like to God the Father this morning. Spiritual thumb sucker. Now let's jump into the outline, okay? Let's get right to it. Why do I need to grow spiritually? Why do I need to? Well, what's the text say? That we should no longer be children. Number one, I need to grow spiritually so I will stop childlike behavior. So I will stop. And we're talking now in the spiritual metaphor we're not talking just about little what little kids do little kids do what they do because they're little kids we're talking about christians believers let me read it to you from another translation then we will no longer be immature like children we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth When we think about little children, they're immature. Let's think of some other synonyms for that. Unstable. Aren't little children unstable? Yeah. Because they don't have they haven't been taught responsibility yet. So they're not stable. There's a lot of Christians that aren't stable in their Christian lives. You say, well, how, what's the evidence that they're not stable? Well, they keep following the newest thing that comes down the pike. That's what the verse says. Right? They're tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. Something new hits the internet and they grab it. Oh, wow, that's great. Why is it great? Because so-and-so said it. What does God say? Well, this person said God said it. <laughs> Did God say he said it? You understand? That's the that's difference, big difference. Now, one of the advantages of growing older in our faith and in our lives is that you get to see a lot of things. Okay? 
And guess what? There is nothing new under the sun. Solomon said that thousands of years ago. That's the truth. There are no new teachings. All that happens is they get named different things. And every 20 to 30 years in evangelical Christianity, supposedly new teachings come along that are not new. They just got called something else. And so a whole bunch of gullible sheep follow after because, wow, so-and-so came out with his brand new teaching. God gave him a revelation. Little children always want the next thing, don't they? What's the next big thing? God says, grow up. Grow up. Don't be like little children. Don't be unstable. Don't be immature. Don't believe everything that you hear. Cracks me up. The, the things that people buy into. Just because it was on the internet. <laughs> if people should learn anything, and this is not politics now. I'm not discussing politics. I'm just showing you something from, from the political world. If people should learn anything from the whole Russian hacking thing, it's that, look, and, and I'm, I'll give especially the, the warning to the kids here who, who might do the dating site thing. Just because somebody puts a picture on there is no guarantee that's what they look like. Think about it. The people buy into it. Oh, wow, this beautiful, this handsome, beautiful person, they want to meet me. And sadly, sadly, there's thousands of sad stories of people who have lost everything, even down to their lives, because they were deceived. They let themselves be deceived. And by the way, there are thousands of, quote, former Christians, whatever that is, who used to believe in Jesus and believe the Bible, but they don't anymore. Why not? Because they were immature. They were tossed and blown about with every wind. And so something came along and got them. God says, we need to grow so we're not like little children, so we're not tossed around, so we're not deceived. Now, so, so how can you tell if you're, if you're growing as a Christian? Well, how, how far from childlike behavior, actions, and attitudes are you? How far from childlike behavior, actions, and attitudes are you? Now, the second reason we need to grow spiritually is be, to become like Christ. To become like Christ, that's verse 15. Instead, we'll speak the truth in love. Instead of being immature like children and tossed about and influenced by people who trick us, we'll speak the truth in love. Notice, in love. A lot of people say, I just told the truth, but they, they bang people over the heads with it. We will speak the truth in love, growing in every way to watch more and more like Christ. You know the hardest thing that, that, that is in the world for people to accept? I don't just mean now in Christianity. The hardest thing in the world for people to accept? Change. That's the hardest thing in the world. Change. That's because humans don't like change. Now, Now watch this. You know what the Christian life is all about? Changing us to be like Jesus. That's why it's not easy. That's why it's hard. You see, Jesus never said, follow me, and it will be so easy. He said, if anyone comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me, right? He didn't say, follow me, and it'll be easy. 
change. See, we all start out the same. The Bible says all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, not one. And the wages of sin is death. Now, the good news of the gospel, and I'm going to teach about this Wednesday night, five things you need to know to share the gospel, okay, the good news. But the good news is that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, if you, if you truly believe and trust in Jesus Christ and ask him to be your personal savior, he will come into your life. He will not only give you eternal life. By the way, eternal life doesn't start when you die and go to heaven. Eternal life starts when you accept Christ as your savior. You know, I know that. That's what the Bible says about eternal life. John 17, Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they can know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ who you sent. So once you get an introduction to Jesus Christ and God, then you have eternal life. It starts when you receive Christ as your Savior. It culminates in heaven. It culminates in eternity. But that's not when it starts. Your eternal life doesn't start when you die. If you're saved, you have eternal life right now. I have eternal life. That's why I can die and be absent from the body, present with the Lord in heaven, because I have eternal life. Now, God wants to give that to everybody who will ask him for it. And if you're here this morning and you've never asked God to give you eternal life and you never told God that you want to trust his son Christ as your savior, that's where you need to start. Now, once you do that, that's not the end of it all. That's the beginning. Now, God's whole purpose for you is that you become like God. Jesus Christ, that he changes you from the sinner that you were to the saint that he wants you to be. Because everybody's a sinner or a saint, and all saints start out as sinners. And when you're a saint, all that means is you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. God sees you now perfect. You're not perfect. But God sees you perfect because he sees you through the perfectness of his son, Jesus Christ. He sees you through the righteousness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who never sinned to become sin for us so we can be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, a lot of people like to talk about predestination and election, all that good stuff, you know? Good. I got a verse for you. Romans 8.29. If you want to brag about the fact that you're chosen, go to it. But be sure when you're bragging that you get the verse, what it says, okay? God knew his people in advance. He chose them. Watch this. There's a people, they they leave this part out. They don't ever talk about this. He, He chose them to become like his son. King James says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That's why I gave you that version, because that's a little easier to understand. They say the same thing, however. Do you see that? We were chosen, not so we could brag about, wow, God chose me, aren't I special? We were chosen to become like his son, Jesus Christ. That's God's purpose for each Christian. So it's how close to Christ-like behavior are you? Well, you know what that depends on? How close to Christ are you? Let me point something out to you. This is especially true about people that have been married a long time. Don't ask me to define what's a long time either. Did you ever notice how people who have been married for a long time Get so they start to look alike. They start having the same kind of expressions on their faces. They start actually having the same kind of physical characteristics. Have you ever wondered and considered why that happens? I can tell you why. I know the reason right here. I'm going to give it to you. Okay? This is a bonus for coming to church today. Okay? It's because people have abided with one another, and the longer two people abide with one another, then the more they start becoming like one another in every way. And by the way, there's a purpose for this trite 
cute little illustration because that's why the Bible says you and I are to abide in Christ. John 15, and that's another whole chapter. I, I've taught through that verse by verse, and I could speak for hours on John 15, the first four verses, okay? That's why the Bible says, abide in Christ. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then watch this. Here's a great promise. You can ask what you want and it'll be done for you. You know why? Because you're becoming like Christ and you're asking for what Christ would want. But the longer and the closer you abide to Christ and near him, the more like him you'll become. John 15, 5, Jesus said, Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's why some Christians do nothing. Yeah, I just solved the reason why it's so hard to get volunteers. <laughs> he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. When people are apart from Christ, when people are away from Christ, people aren't close to Christ, they don't want to do anything for Christ. The closer somebody gets to Christ, the more they want to serve him, the more they want to be like him. You understand? That's not hard to understand. That's pretty easy. Now, becoming like Christ is the result of the commitments we make. We, come be, we become whatever we're committed to. That leads us to the next question. What do I need to grow spiritually? What do I need? I gave you why you need to grow. So you don't be like a child anymore spiritually. So you'll be like Christ. So what do we need to grow spiritually? First of all, we need a commitment to grow. Write the word intentional down. We need a commitment to grow. It needs to be intentional. Spiritual growth, what I mean by that, is intentional. It's not automatic or, or accidental. A person has to want to grow, decide to grow, and make an effort to grow. It has to be intentional, but now watch this. It's not enough, though, however, to just have good intentions, because like they say, you know, road to hell is paved with good intentions, and a lot of other quips about intent, good intentions. So that's not enough. So when I say it has to be intentional, what I mean is you have to have the desire. You have to have the want to. You have to, you have to say, I intend to grow as a Christian. I intend to become more like Christ each day. And if you intend to do that, that's a great start. But please hear me when I tell you that spiritual growth does not just happen because you accept Jesus as your Savior. Churches are filled with people who have attended services all their lives, yet they're still spiritual thumbsuckers. They're spiritual babies. Hebrews 5, 12 talks about people like this. It says, you've been believers so long now, you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's Word. You're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. So, in other words, the longer a person is saved, the more like Christ they should become, and the more they should be able to eat meat from God's Word, not just the milk, and the more they will grow up, and the more Christ-like attitude and spirit they will have. Now, if you have a commitment to grow, then let me give you a plan to grow. Here's the plan. You have to have a plan to grow. A plan to grow. I'm not trying to be smart now, or like this is going to sound, but I'll say it. What's your plan? And then I remind you of this. This is, this is from motivational speakers by the thousands, but it's the truth. To fail to plan is to plan to fail. To fail to plan is to plan to fail. So I ask you, what's your plan? What's your plan to grow? Now, here's how you, here's, here's, here's what it takes. In this plan to grow, you have to do this by means of spiritual exercises, all right? We grow intentionally by developing spiritual habits. You know what a habit is? What's a habit? I don't, I'm not talking about a good habit, bad habit, just a habit. What's a habit? 
A habit is something that you can do without thinking about whether you're going to do it or not, right? Now, how many adult people here who still have their own teeth have to think about every day whether you're going to brush your teeth or not? Anybody? You know, as I said, adult people who still have your own teeth. All right, I qualified it. See, that's a habit, right? Nobody says, hey, I wonder if I should, should have time today to brush my teeth. So what I'm giving you now are habits that you have to develop, and a habit is something you do not think about whether you're going to do it. I didn't say you don't think about it while you're doing it. I said you don't think about whether you do it or not. You got the difference? All right, so what are the habits? The habit of time with God's word. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, as newborn babies, desire the pure work, milk of the word so you can grow by it. 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. See, my friends, Christianity is a process. It's an ongoing experience. It's a life being lived, and it's a process of growth and change. And here's what I've learned. Constantly seeking God's will and God's way in his word changes us. It changes us. Let me give you a, a rather cool illustration of that, of how God's word changes us, all right? The preacher stood on the street corner, street preacher, preaching to anybody who would listen. A man approached the street preacher who looked like he had lived on the street forever, the guy that approached him. Can I help you, asked the preacher. I think you can, said the bum. Would you like me to tell you about Jesus? No. Would you like me to pray for you? No. If you don't want me to tell you about Jesus and you don't want me to pray with you, how can I help you? The guy says, you can give me your Bible. The street preacher said, well, why would you want my Bible if you have no interest in knowing more about Jesus? He said, I can actually believe this happened, all right? Some of you will find a hard believe in this, but it, trust me, worse than this has happened in the Bible. I noticed that the pages of your Bible are very thin. He said, I can use the pages to wrap a cigarette or a joint. Wisdom came swiftly to the preacher who said, I'll give you the Bible if you'll agree to read a page of the Bible before you spoke it. The bum agreed, took his new Bible, and left. The preacher thought he had seen the last of the bum, but, and he knew he could get another Bible. Several months passed, and the preacher was on the street corner once again. A man came up to him, dressed in a three-piece suit. You don't know me, do you, said the man. No, I've never seen you in my life. Yes, you have. I'm the man you gave a Bible to about four months ago. The preacher couldn't believe his ears and his eyes. What happened? He said, tell me what happened. The, the guy says, well, I smoked Matthew, and then I smoked Mark, and then I smoked Luke, and then John smoked me. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrows, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. My mother and father both had written in the front of their Bibles, and I have many of their Bibles. I'm very blessed. I'm, I, I didn't deserve that privilege, but God's blessed me, okay, exceedingly. You know what they both had written in the front of their Bibles, among other things? God's word will keep you from sin. Sin will keep you from God's word. You should write that down and then you should think about it every day because you know what? One of the primary reasons why Christians don't make time to read their Bibles, it's not that they don't have time, that's bogus. The reason Christians don't make time is because when you read God's word, it'll smoke you. See? It's convicting. And people don't want to be convicted because they don't want to change. And what we need to do is say, God, 
Teach me from your word so I can change and become like your son, Jesus Christ. You want to grow? You need the habit of time with God's word. Number two, you need the habit of time in prayer. The habit of time in prayer. You could, next to this, you could write a quiet time. A quiet time. Luke 18, 1, Jesus said, man, I'll always to pray and not lose heart. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18, it says, pray continually, give thanks, whatever happens. That's what God wants for you in Christ Jesus. Bill Hybels, in a book that he wrote on prayer, said this about growing in prayer. If the request is wrong when we pray, God says no. If the timing is wrong, God says slow. If you are wrong, God says grow. But if the request is right, the timing is right, and you are right, God says go. That's how it works. Here's a little poem for you that hopefully will sink in and some people will begin to practice this. It's called No Time to Pray. I got up early one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish that I didn't have time to pray. Problems just tumbled about me and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me, I wondered. He answered, you didn't ask. I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on gray and bleak. I wondered why God didn't show me. He said, but you didn't seek. I tried to come into God's presence. I used all my keys at the lock. God gently, lovingly chided my child, you did not knock. Last verse, listen. I woke up early this morning and paused before entering my day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to take time to pray. That's the perspective that helps you grow. Let me ask you a question this morning. How close to Christ-like behavior are you? How far from childlike behavior are you? I really don't have time to unpack the last parts of the plan, but I'll give them to you. We need the habit of fellowship. The, those who are glad to receive his word were baptized. We're going to have baptism here next Sunday morning. You know who should be baptized? Who should be baptized? Every believer after they're saved. Every believer after. After they're saved. You say, well, I was baptized when I was a little baby. You were sprinkled when you were a baby and you had nothing to do with that. Your parents decided to do that. I'm not knocking your parents. I'm just telling you that's not baptism. Okay? That's not baptism. Some churches call it dedication. I got all that. I understand that. We dedicate babies here. I don't pour in water on their heads when I do it because it's uncomfortable for a little kid, you know. So, But we dedicate babies. All right? And that's fine. Baptism is an act of obedience. We do it after we're saved in obedience to Jesus who said, go and make disciples and baptize them. That's why we baptize. I'll talk more about that next week. There's a sign-up sheet back there on the back. If you have been saved and can stay when that happened in your life, you can be baptized. We'll baptize you next Sunday. You don't have to join this church to be baptized. And baptizing doesn't make you a member of the church. It's one of the things to join the church, we ask for, we want obedient Christians who will be saved and baptized and agree with the doctrinal statement. But we're not, you, you can be baptized and never join this church. It's an act of obedience. Fellowship. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, Acts 2.42, in breaking of bread and prayers. You see, in order for growth to take place, you need support. You need family. That's why little kids do best in a family. Did you ever notice that? Children do better in a family than in an orphanage. Why is that? The family helps the child to grow. So people need a family. The church is like a family. You say, well, it's not perfect. Well, come on in. There's always room for some more imperfect people. The habit of fellowship. The habit of fellowship.
the habit of generous giving. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully reaps bountifully. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Every one of you give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or necessity. God loves the cheerful giver. Luke 6, 38. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shake it together to make room for more. Running over, pour it in your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Luke 6, 38. Does that mean what it says? Yeah. It means what it says. You say, well, does God look at what I keep for myself? Sure does. You say, what's this have to do with being like Jesus? I don't read that Jesus ever gave any money. No, he gave more than that. He gave his life. He gave his life. If we're going to be like Jesus, Jesus said, the Apostle Paul tells us that the Lord Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. The habit of generous giving, the habit of fellowship. You need a climate conducive to growth. That's why James 1, 21 and 22 says, so get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. Humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. It has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. James 1, 21 and 22. In other words, application and obedience promotes growth. Application and obedience. Promotes growth. So ask yourself, how do I measure up? How far from childlike behavior am I? How close to Christ-like behavior am I? I'll give you three more statements and I'm done. You can count them. Obedience to God's word brings blessing. That's the first statement. Obedience to God's word brings blessing. Second statement. Disobedience brings conflict. Disobedience to God's word brings conflict. Second statement. Third statement. Obedience is doing now what God tells me to do with the right heart attitude. Obedience is doing now, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year. Obedience is doing now what God tells me to do with the right heart attitude. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, please. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, maybe as you've listened to this message today, you've thought, well, that's fine, Pastor Bill. You know, I need, I need to grow up and become like Christ, but except I, I, know, I haven't even asked Jesus Christ yet to be my Savior. I haven't accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. Well, I invite you to do that with me here this morning. You can do that right now, there in your seat this morning. If you do not know for sure that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. If you don't know for sure that you have eternal life, you'd say, Pastor, but I'd like to know. I would like to know. I do believe in Jesus, but I don't know that I'm going to heaven. I don't know that God is my father. Christ is my Savior personally. All right, well, then do this. Pray with me right now. If you mean it with all your heart, pray this prayer with me. From your heart of hearts to God, you can just say the words in your mind there, and God will hear them. Pray like this. Dear God, I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. I ask him now to come into my life. Forgive my sins. Give me salvation, eternal life, and a guaranteed reservation to heaven. Help me now to live my life for you and become what you want me to be. Help me to tell others what I've done here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And with our heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer and meant it, God heard you and God saved you. I'd like to thank him for doing that. If you'll lift your hand right now, by that raised hand, you're saying, yes, Pastor Bill, I prayed that prayer with you a moment ago. And thank you, sir. I saw your hand. God bless you. Anybody else? I prayed that prayer with you a moment ago. 
How many Christians would, would, would be willing to say, Pastor Bill, I don't want to be a spiritual baby. I want to grow. And there's some things that I've seen this morning that I could do intentionally in my life to help me grow more, to become more like Christ. God's Holy Spirit showed me some things that I can do, and I want to do them with God's help. Here's my hand as a Christian. Pray for me. Thank you. God bless you. Father, thank you, Lord, that you're patient with us. You're long-suffering. You're a patient, patient Father. You're much more patient than we are. Help us to grow. I pray for each of these dear folks who raised their hands. Help them to do what you've told them to do. Help them to get the plan in place and and work the plan so they'll grow as a Christian. We thank you that you have said, whoever comes to you not cast out. Thank you for this one that raised their hand that they prayed to accept Jesus as their Savior. Help them to, to understand now that they need to follow through on it and they need to keep on going and growing. And help us to do what we can to help them, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand please for the invitation.